Hey, hey, Marcus Hans with you here, and it has certainly been a spectacular week down at the Gateway to Mars. We got to witness Ship 25 rolling out and stacking on top of Booster 9, as well as some integrated testing. Elon Musk posted at the start of the week that Starship is ready to fly. That's right, my friends, we looked to be in the end game, but is that actually true? Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. At the start of the week, these two transporters were fitted with counterweights and ship transportation equipment and quickly moved down to the rocket garden. Starship Gazer was on site as these arrived and remained there to give us this awesome perspective of SpaceX employees preparing the transporters under Ship 25 for the rollout to the launch site. After some delays due to high wind levels, the moment came and our new flight candidate rolled out of the build site in the evening. True dedication there from Starship Gazer who was out there for almost six hours to give us these wonderful views. So thanks everybody for helping him out there on Patreon. Now, you may have noticed these odd cutouts in the ship skirt. These look to be just above the engine shielding panel. So I wonder if this could be part of a similar engine purging system as we've seen on Booster 9 already. Ship 25 continued rolling out into the night. However, at least one of the transporters seemed to have encountered some kind of issue during the move. It ended up stopped here on Highway 4 as they fixed that problem. And around two hours later, off it continued again, this time all the way to the launch site and rolling right between the massive tower arms as it arrived. After deploying the aft flaps and giving some minor persuasion to the temporary plate used to keep it stable during rollouts, the quick disconnect arm swung out of the way and the lift of Ship 25 began. Every single time that these lifts happen with the ship, it is an astounding event. A gigantic robot lifting a 50 meter tall rocket into the air to be stacked onto the even more monstrous booster. Just the tanks alone are nine meters wide, and when SpaceX shares all these images, you can't help but be amazed at the sight of it all. There is so much detail here, and you can even see the stiffener ring used to support the vacuum engines on the ground has been removed. We saw SpaceX do that exact thing before the first integrated flight test. Ship 25 pivoted over Booster 9 and was slowly lowered for that perfect alignment. If you look closely here, you can even see the booster starting to take the weight of the ship. And we were down. Ship 25 and Booster 9 are now the third set of vehicles to be fully stacked on the orbital launch mount. This time though, it breaks the record for the tallest rocket ever, including the previous Starships fully stacked. That is because this one has got the extra hot staging ring added right to it. I must say, it is amazing to think that the launch pad and the re-engineering of everything needed since the first flight in April has been done in just over four months. A true testament to the workers at SpaceX and how quickly they addressed those issues. Now, around an hour after the stacking operations were completed, Booster 9's engine sections were purged for around 4 minutes and 30 seconds. Now, this is pretty odd at first glance, but if you think back to the first flight, SpaceX's timeline showed that from the first ignition to the shutdown of the boost back burn was roughly 4 minutes. I'm wondering if this 4 minute and 30 second purge test could have been a flight simulation test. If we take into consideration that Booster 9 will keep 3 engines on during the stage separation thanks to the hot staging addition there, and also maybe we add a little buffer after engine shutdown, that purge test length seems like a plausible thing. Let me know what you think below. So full stack testing began just recently, of course. Quite a neat series of things to take note of. First, the fire suppression system was tested, followed by igniter firings being heard on Lab Padre's Rover 2 camera. Previously, we would have assumed that these would be for the booster, but of course, now with the hot stage ring, it very well could be the ship on top as well. Booster 9's grid fins were actuated back and forth, and the chopsticks joined in on the fun with them opening, lowering slightly, and then going back to the previous position. I think that what we were witnessing here was a dry dress rehearsal, which is essentially a full launch countdown without involving any propellant load. 
Now, in the super early hours of Thursday morning, it was a surprise to see this manifold being lifted out of the water deluge tank farm. Hmm, that kind of looks important, doesn't it? It is, of course, a critical part of the pipeline system. Now, there was speculation going around that there was damage to it, but here is the thing. Before, only these two deluge water tanks were hooked up, with the third just mounted, not yet fully installed. In the latest RGV flight, you can see that the pipe that connects underneath is just cut off here. This sliced out piece was rolled out, which we believe only had two intakes for the two tanks, and this replacement manifold arrived later that afternoon with three intakes, presumably so that they could add the third large water tank to the system. So yes, that would have been a planned upgrade, I'm sure, and will be installed in no time. Perhaps even more unexpectedly, the ship lifting jig was moved back to the launch site and attached to the crane at suborbital pad B the next day. But why? Well, Ship 26 was preparing to roll out of the rocket garden. Once again, Starship Gazer out there giving us the best views in the house of the rollout, including this awesome view of the ship's engines as it made its way to the highway. Pretty soon it had arrived at the launch complex, the crane attached, and up it went onto pad B. It's going to be an exciting road ahead for Ship 26, a one-of-a-kind sort of vehicle, the purpose of which is still speculative. So hopping over to the build site, we were first treated to yet another booster common dome section heading over to the mega bay. This is suspected to be for booster 13. But look at this. There are four of these circular vents on the side here, which is two more than we've seen so far. We are yet to get a view of the other side. But for now, I think it is safe to assume that this new vent design will be symmetrical. You can also see here that the pipework allowing the engines to supply oxygen gas to the tanks for pressurization has been redesigned. There's no longer this nub at the end of the pipe, and it's now instead a curved section. Not long after, one of the liquid oxygen tank sections was moved into the bay, and these two sections were stacked, beginning booster 13 integration. Also, ship 31's forward dome section was spotted moving into the high bay next door, ahead of it stacking on the nose cone and payload bay. Hopefully, we'll see that event in the coming days. Of course, there's always some more stacking to be done with this roof section for mega bay number two being lifted into place on Wednesday. Just looking down on the site, it is amazing to see the difference from RGV aerial photography shots. All this space now cleared for the Star Factory over just a few weeks. Now, this is quite an interesting one. RGV was also able to grab these photos of what we believe is a human landing system Pathfinder nose cone. Midweek, it was being painted white, which is pretty bizarre in a way. If it's important for the mock-up to look like an actual HLS vehicle, then surely you would pick a nose cone without heat shield tiles. Regardless, I would absolutely love to see what is going on inside. So the next Starship flight test may actually be sooner than many thought possible. And as you may have noticed, we've got a brand new merch design available from today. And this is our non-official SpaceX Starship Booster 9 and Ship 25 patch, all designed, of course, by the incredible Tony Bella. We're selling this on my store for a limited time only, so if you want to remember the excitement from this first hot staged launch attempt, and at the same time help both of us what we do, we are splitting the profits right down the middle to help fund these videos, and of course, Tony's amazing work with these incredible infographics. Just look at the detail on this one for Flight 2. It is just amazing. Anyway, the links to pick it up on all sorts of merch is right here below, and as a bonus, Spreadshirt that runs the store is coincidentally offering a free shipping on all orders from now until Thursday the 14th of September, which saves a bunch, especially if outside the US. Thanks for being here, helping us to get to 500,000 subscribers, and also for resubscribing if you had been unintentionally removed, not just to this channel, but probably loads more channels as well. Thousands of you coming back on board over the past month once you found out. Just to conclude, Starship's updates with Musk's post, although SpaceX are ready for flight, the FAA released a statement midweek as published by Ars Technica. It was stated that the SpaceX Starship mishap investigation remains open, but of course on Friday, the FAA had posted this letter to SpaceX saying that they have actually closed the mishap investigation. The final report mentions 63 corrective actions that SpaceX must take before the next flight, but even Elon was scratching his head a little in this reply to me 
last night. Perhaps this is indeed in the mail. SpaceX had posted this update on the website right after the FAA's announcement, listing the many upgrades and changes made since the first flight. These statements were very much planned to come out at the same time, obviously, so I suspect this is a great step forward. I posted this thought out, and Elon agrees, saying that in fairness to the FAA, it is rare for them to cause significant delays in launch. Overwhelmingly, the responsibility is SpaceX's, so make of that what you will. I've got links to both the FAA post and SpaceX's updates there below. So we have lots more Falcon 9 action over the past week. After two days of delays for the Space Development Agency, Booster 1063 here took off from Vandenberg Space Force Base right after our video went live on Saturday morning. I'll jump into that in a moment, but first a big thanks to Opera sponsoring this video. The new Opera 1 browser has undergone significant changes since I used it years ago, but this latest edition is really neat and it incorporates some terrific features and tools for tech enthusiasts. The most remarkable Remarkable feature catching my attention immediately though is the integrated AI tools. Chat GPT you might have tinkered with and found quite impressive. However, Opera's ARIA takes it a step further, incorporating the OpenAI technology right into the browser, combining that with live web search results. ARIA is built right in to make life easier. Just select some text that you need explaining and BAM, you can get information on that right away. It's amazing how much you find yourself just popping the side panel out and interacting with it right here. Another feature that I've been using a heap is the seamless integration with Messenger applications. Behold, Twitter, or X as it is now called, is right there conveniently pinned within the frame. The same goes for Telegram, WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, and other popular platforms as well, all seamlessly unified into Opera One's sidebar. Speaking of unification, I just love its Tab Islands idea, essentially a better way to group tabs together. This will happen automatically if you've got several YouTube videos open just as an example, but you can also make them yourself. With just a click, you can contract them or expand them out. Great for organization and focused browsing, so why wait? Download Opera One, the new version of the browser. By supporting them, you are supporting my channel here too. Try it out from the link in the description or the pinned comment below. Thank you, Opera. So back to the SDA Tranche Zero mission, I'm afraid to say that this may be the last Falcon 9 stream in this quality for quite a while. More on that shortly, but it was a little unusual to see a daylight flight in a launch, so a welcome view there. Between the fairings was another batch of Tranche Zero satellites, and due to it being a defense and security mission, we were, of course, not allowed to see any of those views. Instead, a time lapse of the exquisite cloud layer falling away as it screamed up to main engine cutoff. Now what we do know is that these satellites will join the first batch of 10 also launched by SpaceX last April. In this mission, the final 13 satellites were being sent, which has the Tranche Zero constellation now complete. In total, these 23 satellites form a demonstration constellation for the SDA to test their future transport and tracking constellations. With these, they aim to get a view of almost anywhere on the planet to track missiles and build a low latency, high data capacity communication network. Work. Now, the great thing about these missions is that there is plenty of propellant left in the booster to return all the way back to landing zone 4, which was spectacular as always, passing down through that dense cloud layer. This was the 13th landing for this booster, the end of another fiery mission, and perhaps the end of quality like this for a while. Why am I saying that though? Well, strangely, after this flight and the departure of Crew-6 from the International Space Station, it was stated on SpaceX's website that future streams were going to be done exclusively on X, not their YouTube channel. Since then, no more missions have been streamed or published there at all. In fact, all the social media links on SpaceX's website have been removed. Anyway, Dragon Endeavour here with the four heroic astronauts screamed back into the atmosphere, the chutes deployed, and slowly it descended to splash down safely in the Pacific. I just love this photo published by NASA of Crew Dragon as it was being prepared to be hoisted up on the ship. With that, Stephen Bowen, Woody Hoberg, Sultan Al Nyadi, and Andrei Fediev finished their Crew 6 mission. I will say I'm really going to miss them on the ISS, and especially all these interesting updates, views, and science info that they shared with us, but I'm pretty darn certain that Crew 7 will be up there to carry on this same inspiring work. 
Speaking of which, NASA has just announced the Crew for the Crew 8 mission which is scheduled to launch sometime near the end of the Crew 7 mission early next year. I think it's also worth noting that at Space Launch Complex 40, the new Crew Tower is finally heading off to be assembled. We see loads of launches from Slick 40 such as this one from the 1st of September, so we'll soon see a bunch of construction around this site here. The end result should be something like this put together by the talented space engineer. SpaceX also launched Starlinks into orbit this week, this one from Kennedy Space Center in Florida with Falcon 9 Booster 1073 flying for its 10th time with 21 Starlink satellites on board. Now this was the very first launch to be exclusively streamed only on X, so we can use this mission to demonstrate the quality difference. This is the entry burn footage here of this mission compared to the previous Starlink mission streamed on YouTube. Yeah, that's quite the difference, isn't it? With the 6.5 million subscribers on SpaceX's YouTube channel that didn't get notified of the mission at all, those of us that were watching live with this resolution were sort of scratching our heads and wondering why. Anyway, let's hope that they revisit that decision as we sign off this mission landing on the drone ship. Just read the instructions. We then had the second flight of Starlink for the week late last night on Friday evening, and another set of 22 satellites placed into orbit. This one launched from Slick 40, again where we will see that new crew tower rise. Only the seventh flight and landing for this booster, and another dark view of Falcon 9 descending down onto the drone ship, a shortfall of gravitas out in the Atlantic. Another huge week for Falcon 9 alone. Now if you have been watching along for the past month, we've been closely covering all the action happening with ISRO's groundbreaking Chandrayaan-3 mission and all of its achievements. Just about a month after, ISRO last Saturday was back at the launch pad for another intriguing new mission, this time to study the sun with the Aditya L1 mission. This spacecraft was launched on top of a PSLV rocket in the XL configuration, and that is in fact the maxed out configuration of that vehicle. That includes a total of six side strap-on boosters assisting the first stage, and look at it go. Off, normal. The four-stage rocket rapidly flew through the atmosphere, and actually, if we rewind and look back again, what you may not realize is that only four of the strap-on boosters ignite on the ground to initially lift the vehicle. After that, the two other side boosters fire up about 30 seconds after liftoff. They then deplete their fuel and separate about 20 seconds apart, which happens a little over a minute and a half into the flight. Following that, the first stage, S139, separated, letting the second stage stage ignite, and then the payload fairings were deployed. Now, the Aditya L1 spacecraft is a solar probe that will orbit the Sun in a halo orbit at Lagrange Point 1. Now, more recently, of course, we've talked a lot more about the L2 point, which is where we place important telescopes like the James Webb Space Telescope. A Lagrange point is a location where the gravitational pull of two large masses like the Sun and the Earth precisely equals the centripetal force required for a small object to move along with them. Where the L2 point is great for telescopes because they are always facing outwards away from the Sun, the L1 point is a perfect spot to study the Sun. That is because you will have an uninterrupted view of the Sun with the Earth behind, and also the Earth will remain that same close distance behind to quickly receive data. Now, this mission aims to study the Sun's corona, solar winds, and coronal mass ejections, or CMEs. These can be disastrous if a sizable one is aimed directly at us. Many may not understand just how big a problem this can be, and it isn't a matter of if, it is a matter of when. The largest recorded geomagnetic event presumably from a CME, was a colossal solar storm in 1859 called the Carrington Event. Now, although we didn't have the equipment to measure that effect accurately, it caused sparks and fires in multiple telegraph stations in the United States. And that was just damage at ground level. If such an event happened right now, who knows what catastrophic outcomes could be involved with the power grids around the world and the complex satellite networks that help drive our technology. It is therefore critical that we understand just how to properly shield spacecraft and the grids on the surface. Yes, missions like this are extremely important research. The spacecraft is equipped with a coronagraph, along with a few other spectroscopy instruments that will make observations in the X-ray and ultraviolet spectrum. Also, instruments that will study particles from solar flares and solar winds.
So the remainder of the flight was largely renders and infographics, the second stage separated, with the next solid third stage booster taking over for around three minutes before burning out. The final stage, the PS4, had its two liquid engines hurling the spacecraft the rest of the way to orbit. Finally, over an hour into the mission, Aditya L1 was successfully separated in a low Earth orbit. At this point, it was up to the spacecraft itself to make it the rest of the way. Right now, it has finished two out of the five burns it needs to gradually stretch out that elliptical orbit before it can break away from Earth's orbit and reach its destination at Lagrange Point 1. This entire journey is expected to take around four months, so hopefully we'll see this in action very early next year. Now looking up towards the moon, night has officially set near Chandrayaan 3's landing spot. The lander Vikram and rover Pragyan were put to sleep by the agency after about two weeks of successful mission objectives. Pragyan had travelled 100 metres away from the landing site as seen in this map released by ISRO. To my surprise, right before going to sleep, the Vikram lander fired up its engines to do a little hop test. It descended up about 40 centimetres and touched back down about 30 to 40 centimetres away. Three of its payloads were redeployed and it made a set of new observations from that spot. That was a great test and such an interesting move by ISRO there to obtain a little more data. So yes, the lander and the rover as we speak are hibernating in the off chance that it can make it through the lunar night. The sun is not rising again at this location until September the 22nd. This by the way is one final image of the lander taken by the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. So while we are on the topic of moon missions, another exciting launch with JAXA and NASA's X-ray Imaging and Spectroscopy Mission, or XRISM, and the Smart Lander for Investigating Moon, or SLIM Rideshare Mission. Off they roared smoothly and rapidly off the pad on board the H-2A rocket. The first stage engine, the LE-7, along with its two solid rocket boosters, shot the entire rocket very smoothly into the sky. This actually is the least powerful configuration of the H-2A. A rocket family with just the two side SRBs. And there they go, leaving the single first stage engine in charge. Main engine cutoff and second stage separation, and that took both its payloads to their intended orbits. SLIM is going to take a relatively long path to get to the moon as we can see here, and it's going to take about four months to get there and will spend another month in orbit before attempting a landing. Our payloads are quite intriguing actually. SLIM actually has not one, but two rover on board, Lunar Excursion Vehicles 1 and 2. Now, these will be ejected out of the lander during its descent. The first is going to use this never really seen before hopping mechanism to hop around the moon and collect data. An interesting looking unit, that one. And number two also looks like a strange little device. Kind of like a toy, isn't it? Well, actually, it was built by a toy manufacturer in collaboration with JAXA. It's really tiny, about the size that you could fit in your hand. Look at it go there. The other satellite on board, XRISM, or XRISM as I assume it's probably supposed to be called, is going to study the universe in the X-ray spectrum, making observations of the fun stuff like galaxy clusters, the behaviour of matter in extreme gravitational fields, the spin of black holes, the structure of neutron stars, you name it. I can't wait to see the results of the observations that this spacecraft will make. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, don't forget to hit subscribe so that we get to keep making them. If you would like to help more directly like the many, many people here over on the right, all this support makes a colossal difference to us. Do remember to pick up this design before the free shipping period ends on Thursday. And if you want to continue with more space goodness, help us out by watching another video. The algorithm thinks that you will enjoy this video here next, or maybe these deep dive videos. Thanks for watching all this way through, and I'll see you all in the next video.